evening, everyone. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much for coming out tonight uh, to this wonderful conversation. On, on behalf of the New York Council for the Humanities, I want to thank you all for coming out for this. Uh, and, and remind you, please uh, feel free over the course of the night to go up and get seconds and thirds. <laughs> we have plenty for everyone. Uh, so my name is Kate Sidley. I'm a grants officer at the New York Council for the Humanities. I'm joined tonight by my colleagues Antonio and Connor, uh, who is uh, right over here. If you have any questions tonight or after the conversation about the work the council does, the programs or grants that we offer, please feel free to flag one of us down. We'd be happy to talk to you. So we're here tonight as part of the council's newest initiative, which is Democracy in Dialogues. And this is a statewide exploration of some of the country's most pressing contemporary issues. Uh, we're handling these conversations in a few different ways across the state. Um, over the course of this entire year, we're gonna be going into communities across New York State, having discussions about things like migration and immigration, segregation, public education, food access, and tonight, gender equality. So we're also gonna be creating a series of toolkits for our community conversations program, which I'll tell you more about in a second. But first I need to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities for supporting this project. Uh, Democracy in Dialogue was actually funded through one of the NEH's uh, Humanities in the Public Square grants, and we're honored to have their support for this new initiative. Uh, I also must thank the Linda and WAMC for, as always, being such wonderful hosts for us. So let's actually give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. You may have also noticed that we have some tables around the room tonight. Uh, we're very happy to be joined tonight by the Women's Fund, uh, the Community Loan Fund of the Capital Region, Carmen's Organization, and Mission Accomplished Transition Services. They're gonna have resources and folks out here the rest of the night, so again, after our conversation is over, if you haven't already, please visit their tables and find out about the resources they have available. Uh, if, after tonight's discussion, you'd like to continue the conversation in your own community or at your own organization, I encourage you to check out our community conversations program that we offer. We have some information and flyers over there on the table by Antonio. Um, this is a program that we offer that you can bring into your community. We provide a toolkit with uh, a reading and resources to start the conversation, and we also provide a micro-grant to help you support doing this project at your organization. Um, they're available on a variety of subjects, including democracy and service, and we're also going to be introducing some new toolkits coming up on segregation, gender parity, immigration, public education, and more. So <laughs> it's growing exponentially, so please check it out if you want to do some sort of conversation like this in your own, uh, in your own community. So tonight, we're here to talk about fairness and equality. Um, it's wonderful to see so many folks come out to have this important conversation. Um, it's my honor tonight to bring up the panel. Um, our host tonight is Allison Dunn, who is the host of WAMC's 51%, which is a program that focuses on the viewpoints of women. So please help me welcome to stage Allison and our panelists. Um, I will introduce the panelists to you, and tonight we'll be hearing from, directly on my right, Barbara Smith. She's an author, activist, and independent scholar who has played a groundbreaking role in opening up a national, cultural, and political dialogue about the intersections of race, class, sexuality, and gender. And to her right is Karen Loscoco, is a professor of sociology at University at Albany. And to Karen's right is Carmen Duncan. She's the CEO, as Kate was just telling you, and founder of Mission Accomplished Transition Services, a nonprofit that helps millennials prepare for the workforce. And I just want to return to Karen, who's going to deliver some opening comments for us. Karen? Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, let me know if you can't, OK? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, I'm, just very honored to be here to talk about gender equality. And I, I have to tell you, though, that for weeks I thought we were talking about gender inequality. And that's kind of an occupational hazard because I've been researching social inequalities for so long that I'm just primed to think in those terms. Now, obviously, the reason that I study 
inequality is because until we understand the parameters of inequity, we don't know how to get to equality. So I wanted to spend a few minutes, and I promise I won't take too long. I actually wrote some things down as I was saying to them because that would keep me uh, on point. Um, but I wanted to spend just a few minutes to talk a little bit about inequality and the reasons um, that it still exists. Now, as some of you know all too well, the path to gender equality has had many twists and turns, and the end is definitely not yet in sight. Of course, there are many wonderful examples of barriers that have been broken over and over again, gender barriers that have been broken by women from all different racial ethnic groups. Um, from all, you know, who have different sexual orientations and gender expression. I mean, there's just been tremendous progress, and yet, sophisticated, systematic research consistently shows us that gender inequality exists at every point in the labor process, from finding a job to keeping a job, to the kind of job you get, the kind of pay you have, the authority, the status, the flexibility, and on and on. <clears throat> now, education is one of the most important tools that women have used to overcome gender inequities at work, um, but even well-educated white women who've been the major beneficiaries of, of changes, of changes in the law and changes in the social norms that opened opportunities up, even they um, do not reach parity with men in comparable fields and positions. So, so clearly, um, there is still uh, very, very uh, much to be done. In the middle of the 21st century, statistics show that whether you're American Indian or white, Asian, Latina, or African American, women are more likely to be poor than men. And contrary to stereotype, the majority of poor people work for pay, as I'm sure many of you know in this audience, but it's a very common continued misconception that poor people are not working, they are working. And there are some wonderful ethnographic studies that routinely discover poor workers who have a work ethic and a motivation that's far superior to the average American worker. Immigrant women are particularly vulnerable to exploitation in the workplace. And if you've ever been to or walked by one of those nail salons that have made manicures much more affordable than they used to be, you may have noticed that the majority of the technicians were immigrants, usually uh, from Asia or sometimes from Latin American countries. But you may not have thought very much, I know I didn't, about their pay and their work conditions. However, uh, we know from systematic research and investigation uh, into nail salons in New York City, for example, found all kinds of really egregious um, activity. Uh, many of the women had been brought, uh, they were essentially bonded labor. They, they were brought in and they had to pay back the people who brought them in. They were often working close to 24 hour days, uh, had you know, very little to eat, and they were being paid sometimes as little as $10 a day. So really, um, real, uh, it's very important to remember that there are so many dimensions to gender inequality, and um, we sometimes forget about the, the most vulnerable people when we start talking about women and work. You know, there's a tendency to talk about middle-class women and work. So uh, research consistently, and if anybody isn't convinced, you know, I have reams and reams of citations for you, but um, clearly there is still a lot 
of gender inequality at work. And so the million dollar question is why? And what I want to do is just outline some of the key reasons. Um, because, again, we, you know, we seem to be in a place where, well, gender discrimination was outlawed, so, you know, why is there still gender inequality? Um, there have been lots of people working really hard to try to answer that question, and I couldn't possibly do it justice in a, in a few minutes. But let me just lay out a few of the major reasons and then we can get to the, the heart of our discussion. But one has to do, there are basically two general processes that overarch all the other explanations that, that we have. And one has to do with beliefs about gender and about the existence of men and women. And the other has to do with the economic system. So women and men are constructed categories. Um, they are fluid, they, we made them up. Uh, they're being contested increasingly, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, but we still mostly believe that they're real. And we try to sort people into one or the other group. And the qualities and activities associated with men are viewed as superior, and those associated with women are viewed as inferior. The economic system in the United States, the capitalist system, predominates over every other system and every other institution in the United States, and it encourages maximizing profit. There is the flimsiest of social safety nets supporting workers who employers seek to spend as little on as possible. That's the dictate of the capitalist system in the US. Obviously, there are many workers who want to treat their workers fairly. There are many employers who do treat their workers fairly. But they do so in a context that absolutely is not set up for that. Now, I just want to, <coughs> excuse me, I just want to point to four more specific reasons for gender inequality. One of the big ones is stereotypes or biases. And this goes back to uh, the idea that, there's, that there are women and men in the world, um, we are wired to think in categories. And because we do, we use stereotypes. And one of the most important things we think we know about somebody when we see them is whether um, they're a man or a woman. Again, we're still not very far beyond wanting to identify, place everybody. And you can see, I mean, that, that's, some of the, um, that's some of what's behind a lot of the um, backlash against uh, transgender rights. People are very, very uncomfortable with the idea of not knowing for sure, not having some kind of biological marker. <coughs> Excuse me. But there's also, so there are these gender stereotypes, and they combine with race. Race is the other major thing that we think we know when we see people. Uh, and we also use all kinds of shorthands that we've learned through our culture to peg people, to decide who they are, what their qualities are, what they're going to bring to the workplace, what we have to watch out for, et cetera. There's also the continuing sense that men are the primary breadwinners for families, even though that is no longer true for the majority of families. That's absolutely not true. But it still has cultural power and is still used as an explanation for why men should make more money than women. <clears throat> Excuse me, why it's OK to pay women less. The idea that women and men are fundamentally different also sets the stage for the exclusion and harassment of LGBTQ employees. Anytime someone is perceived to deviate from gender norms, they're penalized. That happens in many social spaces and it certainly is happening in workspaces all the time. Now, Gender and race combine to create different sets of stereotypes. So when we're talking about what happens to women in the workplace, a lot of times that conversation is about what's happening to white middle class women or white professional women in the workplace. Um, but gender and race and class all combine to create specific sets of stereotypes. Women of color have always faced greater devaluation and been held to different sets of social norms than white women in the US. 
And that's particularly true for American Indians and African Americans. The legacy of their oppression and dehumanization from the beginning of American history is still apparent in unemployment, statistics, and income distributions. Now, most of this is happening covertly rather than overtly, either because of the biases that people have absorbed, often without realizing it, or because of gender biases into how jobs are structured. And that's why people who exhibit bias toward women and men of color and white women often are surprised and a little bit angry at being called on it. Some have no idea that what they just did or said was offensive or hurtful. And this is particularly true when it comes to standard workplace practices. Now one of my favorite examples some of you are probably familiar with um, but I just love this example. In 1970, women made up only 5% of the musicians in the top orchestras in the United States. When orchestras changed the way they did interviews, that figure changed. So when orchestras began to audition people behind curtains that were opaque, women increase their chances of being hired by 50%, according to a major study. Now, were all of the prior decision makers actively trying to make sure that women didn't get the jobs? No, no they weren't. But they filtered what they heard through brains that were wired to believe that well, men were better musicians than women, or that it would be more desirable to have men than women on the orchestra. The second major reason for continued gender inequality in the workplace is the gender division of labor. Uh, <clears throat> the belief in the superiority of men over women was built into the occupational structure. And so jobs dominated by women pay less than jobs dominated by men. And this, by the way, this Dividing people into different kinds of jobs is a very good way for capitalists to squeeze just a little bit more labor power and get a little bit more profit. Um, and a lot of times women didn't even know that that was going on. Jobs are further subdivided by race ethnicity. So within women-dominated fields, African American, American Indian, and some Asian and Latina women have the least desirable jobs, and white women hold the best. Economists have done lots of very fancy statistical modeling, and one of the reasons, one of the reasons, it turns out, a pretty important reason that jobs done by women pay less is precisely because they are jobs done by women. Sociologists have studied occupations that shifted from being dominated by men to being filled mostly by women. The result, the pay and prestige of the occupations went down. If an occupation fills up with women of color, the pay scale goes even lower. Now, when women try to go into male-dominated occupations, and there's been a lot of movement toward that, that was an important goal of the most recent wave of the feminist movement. But what happens when women enter male-dominated occupations is that they often face hostility, harassment, and even violence. And the stronger the male culture, the worse the harassment. I think the military is a pretty good example of that, a pretty bad example of that, I guess is a better way to put it. Women of color experience more and different kinds of harassment than white women do. Um, they often experience something called racialized sexual harassment, and that can happen at the hands of other women, uh, particularly white women, as well as men. And all of these mechanisms help to keep boundaries around jobs and keep them as male-dominated or female-dominated, rather than the fluid uh, entities that they really and truly are. Because in fact, researchers have also shown that there are male-typed qualities and female-typed qualities in all jobs. Pick a job, 
Uh, none of them require only qualities and, and skills that we associate with one sex gender or the other. All right, real quick, I know I'm, I'm kind of, okay, family responsibilities. Uh, I think that everybody uh, would agree that that's an important reason why there's still gender equality. It's not a coincidence that highly paid women are often single and have few or no children. There's a motherhood pay penalty for women. Fathers get a paid premium. The lack of good childcare, of course, is a really important reason that women can't contribute their full talents, as is the lack of job flexibility. Welfare reform forced poor mothers into the labor force, but it did not provide them with the support that they would have needed to succeed. Of course, the US, as we all know, is the only developed country without a national family leave policy. And I have to tell you that not all that long ago, I was talking before a group of people at an international group. And people came up to me afterwards and said, I'm sorry, I don't think I heard you right. You said that there was no national paid family leave policy in the United States. And I said, yeah, I know you did hear me right. And really, people were incredulous. But it's such a rich country. How could that not be part of what people get just for being a citizen, for wanting to work and contribute to the economy? OK, then women make choices. They absorb messages that they're not as capable. They underestimate and undersell themselves. We hear that they choose jobs where they think they'll do well, jobs that seem to match their interests that provide them with the flexibility to balance work and personal lives. And those tend to be female-dominated jobs. It's important to remember that when people are making choices, though, they're making, them, um, they're making them in a particular social context. And there's compelling research evidence that women are penalized when they lean in to exhibit male-typed qualities believed necessary for success. Uh, some really interesting stuff from social psychology. We respond to these women and to dishonest men in the same way. We don't like them and we don't want to work with them. But interestingly, we may give dishonest men a pass if their behavior conforms to what we expect. You know, boys just kind of being boys. And if you're thinking that that helps explain people's emotional responses to Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, you might be right. You just might be right. Many women small business owners opt to be their own bosses to try to sidestep the workplace biases that exist and to attain work-family balance more easily. I have to say that my own study in the Capital District showed that women business owners are very much constrained by the biases of lenders, customers, and family members. One final note before we get other people involved here. Growing class inequality hurts women directly and indirectly. The past 40 years have shown tre tremendous, tremendous growth in poverty. Poverty has deepened. Uh, you all know that the middle class has been shrinking uh, and that the, the tremendous wealth that's been created in the US has been concentrated at the top. Well, that hurts women very directly, but it also hurts them indirectly and is particularly problematic for some groups of women of color. If fathers, partners, and husbands can't find work or are locked up disproportionately, then there's an excessive burden on the women in their lives. Obviously, to get closer to gender equality in workplaces, we have to get people in positions of influence to recognize the structural and the personal biases that are continuing to create these patterns because some of the causes are deeply rooted and multifaceted, some of the solutions will only come from large-scale movements and legal challenges. Meanwhile, there are always, always ways that individuals and communities can maximize chances for women to have greater fairness in the workplace. And, you know, that I probably, probably doesn't need to be said, but I feel I need to say that when we work for gender equality, that improves the lives of men as well, the work lives of men, and the family lives of men as well. So let me stop there and turn it over to, to my esteemed panelists, who I know have many important things.
to say. They do. Thanks so much, Karen, for that. There's so many things I want to launch from from there, but I will just keep it reined in um, because there, you said a, a lot of very interesting and, and needed things. Um, but I wanted to, I was coming up here listening to the radio, WAMC of course, and um, I heard a story that Governor Baker of Massachusetts was going to sign into law next week, equal pay for equal work, comparable work, define comparable. So while that's only one aspect of gender equality in the workplace, I thought we would start with pay. What does equal pay? I think Barbara, Barbara and I were talking back there. And I think you know we'll start with Barbara because she'd like to point out something about equal pay and kind of a misconception that's out there and then launch into stuff that's, that's beyond equal pay. But that is a big part of it, right? The equality of, of pay, salary, and all of that. So Barbara, why don't you start? Right, I just want to thank Karen for giving us such a great uh, and very compact <laughs> uh, background and grounding in the subject matter of this evening's uh, panel. I had the uh, pleasure of working with the New York, New York State Pay Equity Coalition for several years uh, during the mid-2000s. And one of the things that, uh, well, we were, as I said, it was a pay equity coalition. One of the things that we always try to convey, as I will right now, is the difference between pay equity and equal pay for equal work. Uh, pay equity or comparable worth, they're synonyms for each other, uh, is when you have people in different job titles who have to get a similar amount of training or education, have a similar or more amount of responsibility in their jobs, and also face a similar degree of risk, uh, risk uh, often defined as physical uh, risk or danger. And uh, what I learned is that, uh, and I was working with a sociologist um, uh, on uh, this, uh, on the Pay Equity Coalition, what I learned is that any job that you have can actually be compared with any other job because you have these, um, uh, you have these uh, standards and uh, these elements of like, okay, how much training does it take? How much responsibility? And what's your level of risk? Those are the basics. There are others as well. But the thing is you can actually then compare apples and pears because you have these measures that go across job titles. So the most classic example of pay equity, our pay and equity, is the difference between what school nurses, a school nurse, would get versus a school groundskeeper. So they're working in the same setting. One is a predominantly female profession, that is the school nurse position. The other one is a predominantly male position, namely the groundskeeper, groundskeeper, landscaper position. And inevitably, the groundskeeper gets paid more because the female uh, or the school nurse position is a uh, uh, stereotypically female filled position. And then nursing is also probably the most classic example, or one of the most classic examples of a job because it is predominantly filled by women that is severely underpaid and undercompensated. As men go into nursing, compensation uh, rises, but it doesn't rise high enough to make it you know, fair. But I just wanted to uh, illustrate, uh, to uh, you know, elaborate on that for uh, people. There's so much for us uh, to discuss, and I think it's now uh, Carmen's turn. <laughs> well, you might come at it a little differently because if you're encouraging, you know, entrepreneurship, what are you worth, right? How do you know what to add? What did your male counterpart who's starting up X business ask? I mean, you, it seems to me you're in much different territory, but maybe you could address that a little and then talk a bit more about what you find. Um, I mean, as a, as a young, I don't know if I'm that young, but um, <laughs> as a young social entrepreneur who's also a, a black woman, there's, there's, so much, there's so much compacted in that. Um, and I would say, again, some of my male counterparts who are entrepreneurs, I definitely see that they, um, I feel like in some situations they're leveraged more than, than I may be leveraged as a, as a woman that's, that's uh, delivering a service. Um, however, that could also be because I've decided to establish a nonprofit versus some individuals who are in a, in a for-profit realm. 
So that brings in another component as well. What do you, I mean, I'm curious to know, what do you find? Do you find that certain clientele or certain people are attracted to your business because of who you are? Certain individuals, yes, especially people who are connected to me through the Albany community. But when I talk about fee-for-service, people don't really understand that because we are a not-for-profit organization. So people really look at not-for-profits as organizations that are supposed to just give service and products for free. Um, and not recognizing that the organization is still a business and we have to keep it afloat um, while also working with a younger group of individuals, educating um, our, our constituency base about investing in themselves and investing in their professional development and their career mobility. So it, it really starts there with the education piece for people. I think that some people um, do not understand why a not-for-profit organization would, would charge for a service. When on gender inequality, Karen, you got me going on this, um, on gender equality uh, in the workplace, I wanted to know what piece of that, there are so many layers to this inequality, what piece can, what do we need to take care of first and foremost to achieve the rest? I think there needs to be institutional will around some of the major issues and structural problems that Karen discussed. Uh, the fact that we don't have national family uh, leave policy among all of the so-called developed nations uh, just shows that there's something wrong here. And my perspective, I don't know what you'll think, Karen, you'll tell me, I'm sure, uh, my perspective about why we have such a weak social safety net, net in the United States is because of the history of this country and uh, the history of uh, oppression and racism. When I started visiting the United Kingdom, namely London, uh, in the 1970s, uh, I would be talking to these brilliant black women who I was meeting, and of course I was exposed to um, the uh, system of healthcare, universal healthcare that they had, and I said, don't you think, now this is to somebody from, a black person from the United Kingdom, I would say, don't you think that the reason we don't have that is because, or I would assert that the reason I didn't think we had that in the United States is because like with the social uh, safety net that we do have, there it has always been flawed and stymied by uh, racial, the need to keep um, you know, racial groups in their place, and, and, and in some cases gender groups. So when it, when our best example of a social safety net, I believe, up until a certain point was Social Security. When Social Security was initiated uh, during the Great Depression by Frances Perkins, she was a person who really advocated for it in the Roosevelt administration. She's also a Mount Holyoke alumna, as am I. So when Frances Perkins was advocating with others for Social Security, my understanding is that she begged for certain job titles to be included. Those job titles specifically were agricultural work and domestic work. But when Social Security started in the 1930s, agricultural work and domestic work were not included. And you might wonder why. The, most, the majority of black people in this nation at that time were in those two job categories. So into the 1960s, I was born in the 1940s, into the 1960s then, uh, women who had done domestic work women in my family, it was a much more challenging issue for them to get Social Security benefits because they had been in a job title uh, when they were in their working life uh, prime that was not included in the system. So that wasn't just something I read about, that's something that I actually experienced. Uh, so why would this nation, when they set up the first major social safety network, uh, so social, social safety, um, safety net, I'm sorry. Uh, when they set it up, why would they do that? Racism, pure and simple. Exclusion. And I think that every time that we have a push forward for other benefits, the um, specter of the welfare queen, of the, the lazy, the, uh, the, the ignorant, the criminal, all of those stereotypes come flooding out and it really hampers us. It doesn't make any sense that this richest country in the world wouldn't have the paid family leave. But if you want to make sure that certain people stay in their economic position and stay in their place, then you don't put it 
in place and you therefore um, hurt everybody, not just those who you wish to exclude. You know, Karen, you enumerated all the reasons why we have gender inequality. So of, of the list that you, you gave, the compact list that you gave, um, what of those do we need to resolve before moving on? What is the one that stands out? Like, unless we take care of this, the rest is just not going to happen. And as Barbara just pointed out, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a framework that already exists for inequality. And how do we just keep kind of, you know, knocking that down? Do we need a whole new framework, or can we rebuild what we have? Depends on who you talk to. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> It seems to me, and I just wanted to uh, say I completely agree with your analysis, Barbara. And I, and I think you know we saw this. We saw the same thing historically, that um, early on, uh, single mothers. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry, I have a summer cold. Uh, early on, single mothers were were viewed with empathy and a desire to support them. But that was when they were mostly white widows, historically. And as, as the, the, you know, the proportions of single motherhood shifted, um, so did the attitude about why, you know, why women were single, whether they should be single, um, what their responsibilities were as single mothers. So absolutely, um, you know, the, there is a long, long history in the United States of denying to systematically, completely denying to um, African Americans and, and American Indians in particular as the original um, really superly exploited groups. Um, but. Uh, you know, other groups as well. Uh, and, and I'm, getting to the, I'm getting to the answer to your question, but I wanted to finish responding to Barbara. Uh, the, the thing about the economic system in the United States is it grew up with racism. Racism was really good for capitalism. It was really good for it. And, and, you know, and sexism works really well, too. Um, so in the United States, you have also this culture of individualism. And therefore, where other countries have capitalist systems, but they also have a sense that there are things that should be taken care of for people, uh, in the United States, it's like, no, you know, no, everybody's on their own, and for some strange reason, you need a job, or, you know, you have needed a job to get health care. That's, you know, that makes no sense around the world. You tell that to people, and it's like, what? Why because are you I have a body whether you have a job or not. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you have a physical body. All right. Mm -hmm. So now I've completely forgotten your question. <laughs> so <laughs> I, will, I will pose it again. Um, not to worry. So the question is, what of all the inequalities that exist, gender inequalities in the workplace, what do we need to resolve? What do we need to eliminate before we can even think about getting rid of the rest? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that's a, I don't like the question. I think that's why I didn't answer it. Because, because the problem is, unless we completely tear everything down and start all over, um, you know, I mean, that's what, that's what we need to do. So that was part okay. B, actually, the question was, yeah. can we work within the existing framework, or do we need to <clears throat> rebuild entirely? Yeah, I mean, what do you think? What do you think, Carter? That yeah. you brought up a really good point about the fact that we're a very individualistic society. And I believe if we have, if, if there's a change in the way that we think as a community and the way that we support each other, there's a way to change the system. So a lot of times we talk about, um, well, they're one of favorite quotes for a lot of people is be the change that you want to see, right? So you start with yourself. And that could be myself and three of my friends are going to be, ho be housemates. And all of us could, could have very well-paying jobs, but the point is that we're living together because we want to build our collective and our individual wealth. And then once we decide that we want to have a family, because we've saved the amount of money that we need in order to live with our family or the partner that we've chosen, 
our lifestyle may be a little different. So I, I would say that one of the solutions is to kind of change our individualistic mentality to really support each other through the process of the transitions through life. And I also just wanted to build on that and ask you about the, t the take on millennials, because it was interesting during, as we're going through this political process um, on the national level, of course, we're seeing, you know, interviewing millennials saying, well, feminism, what's feminism? The feminism that Hillary Clinton supporters were looking for is not the feminism of, of a millennial. And just, you know, translating that to the workplace since we're talking about change and building a new framework, if we need to do that, what is your advice to millennials or what are you seeing from millennials in terms of gender inequality and what they think about it? So I'll repeat some of what you said <laughs> around it depends on who you talk to. Um, I would say that the individuals that I'm around, I think we're starting to support each other a little bit more. Um, and we're willing to chip in where it's needed so some of us don't have to struggle. So just talking about that communal piece um, and just starting from, from your little pocket. But I'm not really sure. I, I just, um, I'm not really sure because I think the way that some of millennial women, we, uh, the way that we think may be a little different because we, we grew up in a, in a different time. And we had we had different struggles um, that we that we had to deal with. I mean, we have to deal with these things, you know, <laughs> that separate us and all that other stuff. So we have to figure how to break through that. Some of us. Um, so I wanted to talk about fear because it seems to me that there's a degree of fear, and it may be completely conscious or subconscious in the workplace. And I can think of many examples of myself as a white woman growing up fairly privileged <laughs> that I encountered in the workplace simply because I was female. Um, I worked in the financial field very early on and had a, a lot of things thrown at me that when I look back, I go, why did you say something? Why did you tolerate that? You know what? Because I wanted my paycheck. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that it doesn't matter if it was that level job, a minimum wage job, we want our paychecks. And some women and men don't have the luxury of losing that job. It may be one of three jobs that that person is working. So how do you balance I need this job, I need a job, I need this, of, you know, I, I have to support my family or myself or whatever the case is, yet promote change. Well, I want to talk about the fight for 15. Uh, we know and we are uh, in proximity to people who were heroic then because there was a strong push and movement for the fight for 15, a um, $15 minimum wage in the state of New York right here in the city of Albany or in the uh, capital region. Not everybody was from Albany. But the fact that fast food workers at restaurants, probably that all of us have frequented at one time or another, that there was a core of fast food workers who did have more than one job and who said, you know what, enough is enough. Uh, when people stand up against injustice, uh, power relationships shift and change. And what has happened, we now have uh, a $15 minimum wage somewhere in the future <laughs> in New York State, where we have a lesser amount for those who live upstate. We didn't get the universal across the board uh, $15 minimum wage. There are different costs of living, but the thing is $15 uh, upstate or down, it still does not make you uh, living a life of uh, ease. <laughs> you still have to watch every uh, penny better than the 725 or whatever it is now, federal minimum wage. But as I said, we have people who are heroic. I'm not quite sure why I was asked to be on this panel because I am not an expert about uh, any of the issues that we're talking about. I have been involved in the movements, however, that have tried to address these issues for a number of decades. So that may be why I was asked. And I want to then say, uh, just as I've already uh, recently, you know, just, just uh, spoken about the social justice and the activism aspect of how do we address these problems can never be underestimated. None of those people in our state legislature, not, at least not the majority of them, were saying, it. you know what, we really need to get a, minimum, a $15 minimum wage in the state of New York. No. They had to be pushed, and they had to be 
lobbied and they had to be educated. They uh, their hearts had to be reached. Their heads had to be reached. Uh, it was a massive organizing campaign, which is not over. And that's how that happened. And that's how a lot of the things that have made my life better than it would have been had I been born 50 years earlier. That's how all of those things happen. And for the millennials, I do have something to say about the millennials' relationship to feminism. They need to understand that feminism built the world that they take for granted they deserve. Feminism built the world that they take for granted that they deserve. They don't think they need it because they can actually walk into the door of a Fortune 500 company or some other kind of company, present themselves as a female professional looking for an executive level job and be taken at least seriously enough that they won't be laughed out of the uh, office and told to go apply for a job in the so-called secretarial pool. Feminism built that. <laughs> and uh, as I said, I think that um, as time goes on and people face more challenges, they begin to understand like, oh, so that's what those old out of touch people were telling us. <laughs> oh, okay, now, now I get it. <laughs> I don't think we say that. No, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> No, no but there, there's some people who think we, we don't know what we're talking about. And Allison, I mean, I think in an ideal world, the way to get equality is to tear it down, start over. That's not practical. And so the next best thing are large social movements, exactly what Barbara was just talking about. And I think that, you know, we, we are beginning to see pe people first, the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement, obviously all the energy around Bernie Sanders' campaign. People are beginning to flex their collective muscle. And the labor history in the United States is full of women and men from all racial ethnic groups, from all social classes, but particularly working people who worked against tr the tremendous resources of employers, often in cahoots with government, who would send their militia to try to squelch with guns? The, yeah, with guns, yeah. So, you know, to to squelch and, and often did. But there are so many stories, so many stories of success, and I think that sometimes people don't know enough about our own history, in a way, to realize that when you band together and especially if this can be done across race and class lines. Capitalism benefits tremendously, and the people who benefit from capitalism benefit tremendously when people don't work together, uh, when people are busy fighting one another for the tiny, the tiny crumbs that are left, rather than recognizing that if they all got together, they could have a much bigger piece of the pie, that they deserve a bigger piece of the pie, uh, so I, I think we are actually in a moment, in a historical moment, where, where people are energized around changing some of this inequality. You know, Karen, I see and feel that, and actually it was one of my questions too. I feel like, isn't now the time? Because shouldn't we take all this energy, even if it's not directed at gender equality, where we have just so much movement going on in this country right now, and some very negative movement going on as well. But there is this energy, and people seem to be paying attention. And I think when you have people paying attention, now's the time to seize the moment. Maybe a couple years from now, that energy level will be a little, a little lower, and we won't be able to seize upon it as well. And it seems now's the time to galvanize. Is now the time? Now do we? Do we push for public policy? How do we do this? And what public policy might be needed? Barbara? Um, not sure, but I think that that is, I, I mean, I don't know that I would say one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. like rank them. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it's really important to think about policy solutions to major social and economic problems. Mm -hmm. um, there's, re there's reform, there is activism and advocacy. Um, there are different ways of, you know, cracking uh, a system. And I do think that policy solutions are really important uh, too. Um, I mean, we can think of the eight-hour the, the eight day, the 40-hour week, mm -hmm. and as, uh, you know, like a slogan, you know, from uh, some labor union says, says, from the people who brought you the weekend. 
I mean, there were no weekends <laughs> until the labor movement organized, you know, for that to be the case. So uh, I do think uh, policy solutions are important. And I would agree with you, Allison, that this is a ripe time for people to speak out against injustice. And whenever one does that, whatever uh, one's uh, focus is, whatever injustice one is focusing upon, it's going to have ripple effects across the board. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, I really feel that mm -hmm. you can't, uh, it's not like in little compartments anymore. That's what intersectionality uh, is, uh, that you understand, just as you were saying earlier, that uh, gender discrimination uh, ripples t uh, to the LGBTQ community because of gender stereotyping. So that's just like taking gender stereotyping another, you know, to uh, uh, another step. So wherever you're fighting for speaking out against injustice and fighting for uh, humanity and justice, uh, things are going to be uh, changed and make a difference, I believe. Time is up. Thank you, Barbara. Time is um, flying by. Hang up. We'll definitely let you chime in, but time is flying by. We want to involve you, too, in, in uh, asking some questions. Um, and I did want to give Carmen a chance to chime in there. But um, And also just, you know, solutions. And maybe you guys will ask some questions about solutions. But I also just wanted to say that on that, on that topic of the time is now, activism is rampant, people are paying attention. Status quo is what we're hearing. We've got to get rid of the status quo. You're hearing it on both sides of the aisle. You're hearing it in every facet of life. Let's get rid of the status quo. To me, let's get rid of the framework of gender inequality, right? I mean, we can use this to do that. Carmen, you were going to say, and then we'd like to open it up to the, uh, to the audience. Two policies I, I think is really important to, to organize individuals who are around my age, which I'm in my early 30s, is around Social Security. That's one, because it's possible that we may not have that. Um, for, for my age group, and then for our high school students to encourage them to organize around education policy when, it, when it's related to tuition. Because the, the higher the tuition becomes, the less likely certain individuals are going to be able to access college opportunities, which college is not the only way to make a livable wage and to have a well-respected career and to be respected in, in the community. There are tons of vocational programs out there that individuals can participate in and, and, and receive the credentials that they need in order for them to have a comfortable lifestyle. But the majority of our young people, college is shoved in front of their face. So if they decide that they want that to be an opportunity for them, they, they should not have to um, they should not have to defer from it because, because they can't or afford it. Or be in it. debt until mm -hmm. um, they're uh, late middle age. Yeah, <laughs> right, thank, thank you so much yeah. for that. So this is a dialogue, and so let's make it a dialogue. And please feel free to ask questions of any or all of, of the panelists. Does anybody have a question? And please feel free to step up to the mic if uh, you'd like to ask. No, nobody has a question about gender, a solution? Does anybody have a solution? We'll take those as well. No, nobody wants to, to offer a solution. Yes, please. My name is Paula Rollins, and I um, was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, but moved to upstate New York 52 years ago. Um, I did not know when I was teaching in the Midwest, in Cincinnati, and in Fort Wayne, Indiana, that politics is in everything. I did not understand that. Right after coming to New York, however, the decentralization of schools in New York City was about to happen, was underway. Um, and I really got the picture then. I just understood politics is definitely part of education. As a matter of fact, I now believe firmly, as I'm sure many of you do, politics is part of everything. Because it basically is about interrelationships and alternatives to solutions. Um, and point of view. So one of the things that I think we are in need of doing is to recognize that women need more roles in politics. Not talking about this current situation one way or the other. What we're up against is the reality that we can be the instruments of change and that that is the thing that we collectively can help happen. 
We've seen such small numbers in political situations at whatever level you wish to look, towns and villages, states and state governments, Congress, and beyond. And that's the thing that we can help change, and it's the thing that we need to collectively begin to look at. It has so much potential for what all the issues are connected with equality and equity and the future. I think for our girls, it's extremely valuable for them to have the models of women who have taken the risk, have made the decision, and are making a step toward becoming active in their communities as social activists like our and like Karen, and like Karen. Is it Karen in our life? Yes. Yeah. Because that is a, you are models as a result. And I think that's a very important role for mothers and fathers to encourage in their girls. I think of increasing the idea that you can do what you believe you can do is being inculcated in, our, in, in the children. It's not, of course, universal because it's, again, this business of the role of some women who have taken on, because of the requirements of their lives, double duty, and sometimes in a sandwich position, that they have responsibility to two generations or more. It makes it very difficult as a result to be a role model and an advocate. But I think encouragement of that is a thing that collectively needs and warrants being done. I wonder if 50% of the uh, women in Congress, uh, people in Congress were women, I wonder would we have uh, paid family leave? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because there, at least there would be somebody there who could have a, you know, a fact-based conversation about it. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, great minds looking into this. How do we get women into politics earlier? Obviously, they're not going to just appear, although nowadays it is possible, uh, on the congressional, in a congressional race. I mean, now we can think of examples. But the idea is to put, <laughs> put, through, the, you know, put through the system some women really, on the town level, on the village level, and all of that. And it's, for some reason, very difficult to do that. Is it because there are family responsibilities and working? Yeah, I'm just throwing this out. I'm not, I'm not saying that's the case. But they're really looking into why aren't we getting a, a larger number of women to participate in the political process early on and start getting going on public policy and rise to the ranks and everything like that because certainly the numbers are, are, are embarrassingly low, you know, and, and if we're not represented in, in Congress and on the state level well enough, how do we expect to get policies that treat us fairly passed? So maybe, Barbara, did you want to speak more to that? or Carmen, I just want to say I gave it the office. I served for two terms. <laughs> <laughs> And we thank you. <laughs> on the Old Common Council, so, you know, whoever, I never thought I would, but I did, so there you have it. And doesn't this just raise the question of not just any woman? Do you want just any woman? Just like, do you want just any man in a political position? I mean, that person has to represent your views, right? I mean, there's that too. Well, I, I, I feel that there's a lack of mentoring up within the within a lot of our systems, the, the community system, the education system, the professional system, I just, I don't feel that there's a lot of mentoring up. I don't feel that there are a lot of women out there who, who are in political positions that say, I think that, you're, that you would do a really good job, I'm going to be your mentor. I think it's more of, I have to come to you and say, that's what I want, and then I kind of have to run after you to even be my mentor. So just talking from the perspective of someone that may potentially like to get into, into politics one day, I mean, I have a brain trust right here. So I, I know that, I, that I, can go to, I can go to her. This is like platinum over here to me. <laughs> so, but, but I just, I don't, I, I do feel that there's, that there's a lack of that where someone identifies a, a young woman and says, you have a voice. Clearly it needs to be strengthened and clearly we may need to do some polishing in certain areas. And I'm willing to take on that responsibility and I may not be able to mentor anyone else for the next six months or the next year because I wanna invest my time and energy into this person to make sure that they're gonna go into this specific role, whatever it is that they wanna go into. And I know that there's campaign schools out there, um, but just to have someone come to you and say, I see this in you and I want to help you cultivate that. It's just something completely different. Interesting, and, and there's study after study that says a woman, or 
if you're looking for a mentor, you need to see someone doing the job you want to do. You need to see someone doing, and by job I don't necessarily mean for pay, uh, but you need to be seeing someone doing what you want to do. If you don't see that same face or same gender, you're going to really question it. And you may not think that, but there, there are studies, and, and they've, you know, they've talked to women of all ages about this, and it seems to be, it seems to be quite true. I don't know, Karen, do you have something to say to that? Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing is that, remember that politics is a male-dominated occupation. So it has all those characteristics. Um, so women are not seen as natural politicians. They don't fit in that arena. And there, are very, there have been very practical issues. I mean, politics takes an incredible amount of time and energy. The higher you go, the more time and energy it takes. So uh, it, it, you know, it's, a, it's a kind of rarefied group of men who can go into that job, you know, which is why it's been. Uh, and increasingly, it's a very expensive proposition. So unfortunately, it really favors you know, well-to-do men. Um, so that's part of the problem. And then the other thing is about many occupations, um, and particularly when they're gendered like that, what men do then is they reach out to other people like them to bring them along. And that, again, doesn't have to be some kind of overt bias, but it's just like, oh, you remind me of me when I was starting out, and, and, and let me bring you. And one interesting thing that researchers have found relates to what Carmen was just saying, because when you were talking about mentoring, you were, it, it was reminding me of what researchers call sponsorship. And they make a distinction between the fact that women often get mentored, someone who's there and you can talk to them, and you know, they'll maybe show you the ropes a little bit. But men get sponsored in organizations. Somebody takes a very personal interest, and their own success is predicated on the success of this particular person that they're sponsoring. They do it very visibly. So the, the culture of mentoring and sponsorship has to change. And I couldn't agree more with the, the woman who spoke. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Paula. Paula. Um, that role models are, in, are just incredibly important. And I have one little example that I love from uh, social psychology. So they gave women, women and men were gonna give a speech, and before they gave their speech, there were different conditions. So some of them saw a photo of a woman, uh, a very well-known woman politician. Some of them saw a photo of a, a man who was a very well-known politician, and some of them saw no photo at all. And they used two different women politicians, I'm not sure why. So women who saw these, these very well-known and very successful women politicians gave longer speeches, and their speeches were viewed by both themselves and by observers as better than women who, eat, who were given the photo of the male politician mm -hmm. or no photo at all. Just seeing the photo changed their performance objectively and subjectively, interestingly. Or maybe they're just good, you know, they knew when they had done well. And for the men, didn't matter. Didn't matter what photo they saw or didn't see. That, that was not important. And that makes sense. That makes sense. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? Or Yes. Uh, yes, hi. My name is Margaret Gaines, and I would like to thank you people for being here tonight and giving us this wonderful presentation. I have a question and concern. In this very um, negative, and kind of hateful social political environment that we have today. Can we see that social movement actually progress? Or are we kind of encumbered with, I mean, we're talking negativity, hostility. It, it's, it's not good out there at all. That's my question. I believe so. It, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person. I believe that anything can happen as long as you put your time and energy into it. It would take a lot of time, it would take a lot of effort, and it would take a lot of strategy in order to, 
to break through all of the craziness that, that we're seeing right now. And it would take a lot of patience. I think sometimes when we, when, we, when we band together around a specific issue and it's not happening right now, people start to leave. Or a conflict starts to happen within, within the group and people start to leave instead of figuring out how to resolve the issue from within because we're, we're going to have to agree to disagree sometimes. You know, and it's, it's as long as you respect one another while we're moving towards a, a common goal, then we're going to we're going to get there. I mean, I'm I'm again, I'm you know, I'm a I'm a young black woman. There's a lot of things that I would not do today if it wasn't for Barbara and Karen and, and Allison. Like there's a lot of things that I would not be doing today. And I'm sure that you have been beat down multiple times in order for me to be sitting on this on this stage with you. So it, it really takes a lot of patience, a lot of resilience, a lot of focus, and a lot of strategy. So I believe anything is possible as long as you're willing to unify. Is it Margaret, did you say? Sorry. Yes. Um, you know, I'm wondering, and, and this prompted it, I wondered it before, as we're talking about gender inequality and you talked about all the negativity out there, I'm assuming that some of what you're talking about is the racism that we're seeing and the violence that we're seeing around the country. And you know, my question is, how do we start breaking down gender inequality when this is rising up? Well, Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement is led by uh, black women, often who identify as queer. So the thing is, they make the connections among and between the various injustices and isms. So I don't think that we have to be uh, completely pessimistic about uh, well, given that there's so much uh, racism and so so much uh, so many extrajudicial killings of black people in the country uh, by uh, public safety officers, um, does that mean that we should pay only attention, only pay attention to uh, racial? Uh, you know, the, uh, issues of race and racial violence during this period, or can we look at something else? The people who are leading this movement are looking at all the things all simultaneously. I just uh, moderated a panel a few weeks ago in June at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, and it was about the connections between the Black Lives Matter movement and the LGBTQ uh, movement. Th that was what the panel was about. And uh, it was connected to San Francisco Pride. And we talked about all the things that we needed to talk about in order to uh, work toward a just, wor a just world. So I don't think we have to do the either or. Some of us are experiencing all of these things simultaneously anyway. So you know, we, would, we can't put one part of us on the shelf and say we're only going to deal with X when we're also uh, affected by Z and W, et cetera. Uh, but as far as like um, whether there are, whether we can be optimistic about the future, what really bothers me is that um, we're in a situation where, in which the nation state and the democratic project uh, and the, this country could be set back many, many, many years uh, because of the uh, inadequacy and uh, the, um, ha the hatred and the vitriol and the bigotry and the ignorance that characterize uh, the politics. Political differences, there's not really anything wrong with that. In fact, that's what we're supposed to experience and figure out how to negotiate in a democracy. So it's not the differences, it's the worldview. <laughs> and people elsewhere in the world are quite concerned as well. So that's my thing. It's like. You know, all these years, all this incremental change during my particular lifetime, you know, when I was born, most black people in this country couldn't even vote. Do you see what I'm saying? And then there was a civil rights struggle and then voting, the Voting Rights Act and et cetera, et cetera. Incremental changes, but real changes. And, you know, like I think about the NBA uh, pulling its all-star, it's the all-star game out of mm -hmm. North Carolina mm -hmm. because of their incredibly backwards uh, views about uh, people who don't identify as cisgendered heterosexuals. 
And so, like, who would ever have thought that that was a possible a thing? Was how, could that be a thing? The NBA, really? Okay. So the thing is, these are incremental signs that you know we're on a, a good path. And then to have everything just thrown back, you know, to the pre, you know, uh, pre Jim Crow era, it's just like, oh no, please no. <laughs> and did you have a follow up? Did anybody? Yeah. No, I just wanted to share a, a, a little story that I heard and a sample of hateful rhetoric. And it was at the Republican National Convention and this representative on live TV said Hillary Clinton is guilty of treason and they should take her out and shoot her. Mm -hmm. I mean, he said that. was it. On live that was TV. That was it. I, I, you know, like, where are we? North Korea now or, or, right. or you know, Syria or something? I, I can't, and, 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 there wasn't really a big backlash. Right, right. People need to be paying the attention. The reaction from all of us is also what concerns me. I just Anybody else? Thank you. I yes. did have one other thing I wanted to say. Sure. Not, then we'll get not to now. That. It doesn't have to be oh, now. Okay. I just need to get it out. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make sure that we um, unpack the notion that the only thing that prevents women from getting equal pay is because they don't know how to negotiate. Uh, that's one of the favorite uh, uh, kind of tropes that we see, particularly from Mika Brzezinski, because she has a little side industry going. She's on Morning <laughs> Joe. But you know, one of, one of her other things that she does is to get women to know their worth, because she you know, found out she wasn't getting paid as much as the other male uh, journalists. Uh, and she went and she demanded and she got it, and now you know, that's just the way to go. Fine, all well and good. But that's not, that has nothing to do with structural inequality. Mm -hmm. I mean, our minimum wage sisters and, and the majority of the people who are earning a minimum wage are indeed female. So and there's, like, there's often backlash when women mm -hmm. negotiate. You know, mm -hmm. the, the idea that if women just knew how to negotiate, they'd be fine. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, plenty yeah, of evidence that that can backfire for women. Yes, because it's a, again, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to be nice and kind of take what they offer you. And it's such a simplistic way of understanding. And every time she starts talking about that, I keep thinking, does she, has she ever heard of pay equity? I mean, has, does she know anything about this at all? And then just a little saying, uh, people talk about women uh, breaking the glass ceiling. We also need to be concerned about the women in the basement mm -hmm. and getting the women out of the basement and then getting rid of the basement. Mm -hmm. So that's another way to think about it. You had a question, and of course I, I, I have to just ask, the, how do we know? How do we know we're getting paid equal? Go ahead. Um, oh. <laughs> it's a question, but it's, I don't know how to phrase it as a question, so I'll just kind of say it. Sure. When someone mentioned uh, the NBA pulling out of uh, Charlotte because of laws in that state that they view as very big. Um, that is essentially a capitalist system using the tools of capitalism to force change on policy level. And my background is in technology, and I'm very interested in using technology specifically as a product of the capitalism as a tool to then dismantle it and further pursue the goals that we're talking about here, which is on the other thing, getting involved with the intersectionality of everything we've been talking about. So, I guess the question then is, um, how do we use the tools of capitalism, in this example of technology, uh, to disrupt the system that is being uh, used to oppress certain groups? I'm really glad you brought that up because in response to your question about optimism, I was going to say that for me, one of the causes of optimism is the change in technology because the very the very tools that can be used to divide people can also be used to unite them. And so the technology offers a possibility of bringing people together like none we've ever had before. So if people are willing to use technology to work for the kinds of equalities we've been talking about tonight, they can do so. I mean, look at the most recent social movements, political campaigns. 
I mean, first President Obama used the internet in a way it had never been used before, social media to mobilize, and certainly um, all of the campaigns have done that uh, this time out. So every, everything we're worried about and everything we're afraid of can also be turned on its head if enough people are willing to do so. It does mean getting involved. And I also just want to kind of like Barbara, I have a few things I want to be sure I say. And one is to absolutely never underestimate the importance of who is president. I hear a lot of people talk about how it really doesn't matter very much because we have a corrupt system. And we certainly have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to argue that point. But what I can tell you empirically is, is that the, one of the main places where we got derailed from that project of equality that Barbara was talking about was the 1980s and the election of a couple of presidents who dismantled unions, took away regulations, uh, made it much easier to move companies overseas. I mean, these are policies. This didn't just happen to us. This this growing inequality, this concentration of the wealth at the top, it didn't just sort of magically happen overnight. It happened because of very specific policies that were either put in place or dismantled. So that means that policies will be put in place by the next president. Absolutely. Did you have any follow-up or did you want to hear from anyone on um, what you were commenting on? You sure? Okay, and you, you probably know more about that than <laughs> any of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's your idea? Sure, I guess some examples to give uh, the, the ones that pop in immediately are, well, let's take the attribution of your discipline. Take mine from the mic. Thank you. Well, let's take um, the example Black, Light, Black Lives Matter as a, a place to start. So because of the existence of cell phone cameras and because of the existence of laws that allow citizens to record things that happen in public, which is not considered a, a private place, it means that you are allowed to record police as they go about doing whatever it is that they're doing as long as it happens in public. So we have this technology that makes that is now ubiquitous. It's in my pocket right now. It's in all of our pockets of purses or bags or whatever. We need to be able to I guess, have the freedom to incorporate the technology um, in order to make a more just society. And I guess, I, I, I'm not very good at public speaking, so this is me kind of being really nervous and trying to get out my points. Um, but mm -hmm. specifically what's, what's been going on in all of these killings, I, I would encourage people to look at actual statistics of crime rates going down in the past few decades. They've gone way down, and this is a trend that has been continuing even this year. Even though killings have gone up by a few percentage points, they are still radically down from where they were when I was born in the early 90s. So one thing to be aware of is that because we are so overexposed to a, 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 a huge amount of information all the time through social media and through the news feed and the scroll and whatever you want to call it, um, just because we're seeing it doesn't mean that there's more of it. It just means that we can see it now. And this is something that uh, specifically in this country, minorities have been dealing with for the whole time that they have been disenfranchised. But now that we're actually able to have physical proof of it happening, is it getting any attention? And, and that's something that I think is just so important to keep in mind in this conversation. This is nothing new. It's just now we have the technology that are allows us to see it. To sometimes it be real. believed. Yeah. To sometimes so, be believed. Sometimes, right? Yeah. And, and that's a whole other part. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's all. Thank, thank you. You thank did a great you. job. Yeah. Just as Carmen said, you did a great job. I believe you had a question? Yeah. Um, um, I had a question about the women's equality agenda that was on the state's work, um, radar. I know it was on the governor Cuomo's radar uh, and a couple of senators and uh, assembly members uh, about two years ago. And what happened? That. Is it still? Nine of the ten points um, were passed in different pack. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't. It, it never. It got dismantled as a ten-point package, and a lot of the legislation, except for codifying uh, abortions, got through. Um, that was really the sticking point, and that 
uh, Governor Cuomo and others saw that wasn't going to make it, but they didn't want to keep up the rest of it, even though in the beginning, as you said a couple years ago, they said it's only 10 points or no points. We need it, we need it all. Well, they, as, as politicians often do, uh, compromised. So that's why you didn't hear it as the women's equality agenda, because it became something else without that one point. In my understanding for the point, uh, the 10th point uh, around reproductive freedom that they uh, removed so that they could pass the other nine, that was to get uh, abortion law out of the criminal code and put it into mm -hmm. the civil code, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So it wasn't uh, Roe v. Wade right. uh, guaranteed the ac access, although people have done everything since that time, uh, as witnessed by recent, uh, the recent uh, Supreme Court case that rule to maintain reproductive freedom. I'm talking about the uh, Texas case uh, and the trap laws, but the thing is Roe v. Wade uh, embedded uh, the a access and the privacy, you know, of women with their doctors making uh, their own choices and decisions. So there's nothing that New York State law would have done that would have um, that that would have materially altered that because it's constitutional. But it is. But abortion laws in New York State are still in the criminal code. So that's mm -hmm. what they wanted. Mm -hmm. It was, it was like, let's get it into the right part of our law, but they couldn't get it past the... Still, uh, still controversial yeah, enough, yeah, which, which yeah. raises something in my mind, and my thought is if men are controlling our bodies, I don't know when we're gonna make progress, um, because oh. I think that fundamentally, if they're actually controlling bodies, mm -hmm. the rest of it, to me, that's what has to go, and when I asked, I wasn't asking with an eye to that, it just came up because of your question, actually, and that, that's just how I feel. I just feel that that has to go before everything else can come into place. But I think that's all the time we do have for tonight. I want to thank our panelists. It was absolutely fascinating for me. Yes. Thank you. Karen and Carmen and Barbara. And if you want more information about the New York Humanities Council and the dialogues that are going on around the state, as Kate pointed out, they do have a, a table over there and can give you any information uh, you would like to perhaps get a toolkit for your community as well. Thank you. Thank you.